Hey everybody, welcome back to the shop for another week of s and &S, and we've got plenty of machine work for this episode. We've got some shaper work, I've got some milling machine work over here on the K&T, and I think I got some other things to mix in there with you, so we'll just see what I can, what kind of mix I can make up for you. And we, we also have a viewer gift this week, but this viewer gift is not for me, it's for somebody else, and I'm going to just... Uh, put that video in there for you to enjoy and uh, hopefully you will so I <clears throat> tell you what man it's been hot <laughs> it's been hot down here in the south it's here it is mid-august and uh, humidity's just been all the way up there 100 percent and it's just been hot outside but I wanted to uh, talk here briefly about what's been going on with the shop work here you know the shop enclosure so I've been getting estimates from contractors, real contractors, okay, and I, hopefully I'm going to have somebody that I'm going to have start on this work here pretty soon. It still may be a couple weeks before the work even starts. I don't know, you know, but uh, I, I've got to pretty much pick somebody that I want to do it. I've got prices now uh, from a few different people, and I think I know who I'm going to talk to about it. So. I got to follow up with them and uh, make sure that all the numbers are there and you know we, we've got everything like it needs to be everything's understood so we got that going on and, and I'm looking forward to showing you some good progress and these, these contractors you know I, I even made it aware that this is this is gonna be on YouTube that I make videos and all of them are like okay you know we don't have no problem with that if you want to film us whatever they all feel confident in the work that they're going to do will be professional. The Some of the work that was previously done will be corrected or fixed to, to make it right, you know. So, but how, <clears throat> what I'm having done is still, the, the, the plan of what I was going to do is still on, you know. Metal on the outside, metal on the inside, insulation, some of the electrical is going to be redone, and plenty of lights out there. So... That's kind of the, the whole deal, uh, you know, finish out the bathroom, put a roll up door and an entry door. So that kind of stuff. All right, so that's still in the works, but hopefully a couple weeks that, that'll get going. If, uh, if I have developments on that next week, I'll be sure to let you know. And I actually, I just come in from talking to a professional concrete contractor here in Pensacola. I feel very good about this guy. He's been in business for 40 years doing this work, and he was the first one to come out and meet me face to face. He was honest up front about how he bids his jobs, what kind of job he does, what, you know, giving me the whole rundown of how he does his work, and I feel very confident about it. And I've seen his work because uh, Motion contracted him to do some work down there where we're at, and he did a great job. So I feel very confident with him. Not the uh, cheapest price in town by no means, but he's a pro. He's not a wannabe. So he's going to charge accordingly and do the work. What we've talked about doing out front would be a six inch slab. Probably have to grade it as it goes further out. It'd probably be more like seven inches, possibly as it gets further out. It'd be have a, have a ramp on the outer end. I think uh, some kind of footer there to kind of keep the end of the concrete from breaking as you drive up on it. Rebar, have a grid of rebar throughout. I believe it was 12 inch centers rebar. And as one of my viewers has suggested, dowel pin the exist, existing slab here. So drill into the, the slab and have dowel pins rebar sticking out of it and have another one going across tying all those in together and then pouring on top of that. And then there's gotta be some forming done to kind of transition things how they need to be because the grading out here and the two slabs are different from each other so all that kind of takes place there and so anyway he's he is giving me prices on that and also I want a slab on the back of the house for the back patio which would be 12 foot out same thing as it's out here on the shop I figure 12 foot out is a good size for a patio and then the length of it that I want to be which would be all the way down to where the chimney is 31 foot down so we'll have a 31 foot long patio on the back and if I if I can swing doing that 
and that at the same time, it'll save me $500 on the job there. So that's what I got to kind of figure out. But we've got to do, we need to get the shop done first. That's the first phase. And then once that's tied up and, you know, it's ready, then we can move on to the concrete. So I'm very excited about getting this stuff done. It's things that I have envisioned for the shop for a few years now. And it's working towards making this a better, more functional shop in the future. So anyway, that's where we're at on that. Next week, I'll give you some more updates. If, if I have some to share with you, if we're going to get started on the, the shop out there. And other than that, we're going to, we're going to dive into the machining footage here. And I'm going to try to give you the best video that I can edit together for you this week. Okay. Thank you guys for all the continued support. All you guys out there that's watching, liking, leaving me comments. All of my Patreon supporters, all you guys, everybody. So, thank you very much. What you got there? A what, prize. What do you a what? <laughs> a prize? <laughs> That's a prize. It says Abby's gift. Abby's gift. It looks like Abby got her very first viewer mail yes, from I a did. from a viewer of the channel, and she is pretty excited, aren't you? I'm like level twelve excited. Like level 12. <laughs> I got a thing in the mail. Actually, it's been a little while. Mm -hmm. I got a little thing in the mail, you know, whenever you're not home because sometimes people send you stuff where you have to sign. And uh, I set it on the bar in there and I kind of forgot about it. And then uh, I found it. So we went to the post office today and picked this up. And where is it from? It's from Sweden. Sweden. Which I want to go to. That's where some of the finest tooling and watches are made, right? Obviously some of the people. precision mm -hmm. so a gift from sweden so we got it right on there abby's gift <laughs> <laughs> so can you want to open it up and see what it is yes can I? she is very excited about this yes and i told her that she couldn't have it until she opened it up for you guys to see what does the letter say You will like this little gift. The ring is made of grade 5 titanium, which has been sandblasted and oxidized. The blue groove in the center of the band is made by anodizing the titanium. I did set a cubic zirconia stone in it, which is a synthetic stone. It's heated in a sterling silver setting. Nice. I altered the finish a little bit for this ring, trying to make it a little bit more unique and perhaps machine shop inspired. Yay. Oh, cool. <laughs> As I said, I don't know if it's a hit or miss. Of course it's a, a hit. I haven't even seen it. Please let me know what you think. So. And who's it from? It is from Robin Keller. Robin Keller. So, Robin had emailed me. It's been probably two or three months now. And uh, he he's a ring maker. And he watches the channel. I really enjoy watching your videos. Yep, that's, <laughs> he had mentioned that in his email that he really enjoys watching the videos. So he had offered to make a ring for Abby as a gift, uh, just just because he wanted to, and uh, he really enjoys the videos, and he enjoys watching the videos that Abby and I are in together as well. I so, want to open it. I can't wait. All right, we'll open it up. Let's right. see what this thing looks like. Okay. Uh, man, look at that. Wow. That is beautiful. Very cool. So it has kind of a... Oh, look. Oh, it has Abby Lee in it. Oh, wow. That's so awesome. Does it fit? It fits perfect. Look All at right. that. All right. That is amazing. Very cool. And handmade. A handmade gift all the way from Sweden. Thank you, Robin. It's... I love it so much. You couldn't have done better. She has been over the moon excited about this gift for a very long time. <laughs> it was my fault that I didn't go down there and pick up the uh, package for a I while. I love it. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll set up the little camera over here, the Sony, and get you a little closer shot of what the ring actually looks like. So uh, thank you very much, Robin. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a very, very generous gift that you made for Abby yes, here. Yes, very generous. <laughs> So Abby's trying to give you a little close-up of what the ring looks like. She's going to do some finger modeling for you. <laughs> and hopefully you can see that real well. Uh, really nice detail work on the ring. 
And can you show them the, your name? Yeah. How do we? Very cool. I like the way that, that was done on there. I with do your, too. It, it looks it. like it was just hand, hand engraved. I love the blue. Yeah, that is and a nice touch. And the detail, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. The color is so cool. All right, Robin, thanks again. I really appreciate it, and uh, I know Abby's going to absolutely love it. Yes, sir. Thanks, Robin. So this is the project that I wanted to practice on the shaper with right here. This is a 6-inch thick piece of 836 steel. It's been flame cut, and the sides are what I need to clean up. So, I, I wanted to use the new vise right there. There, there it sits. And unfortunately, this is just too large of a workpiece. Once you set it in the vise, it's just too far up to use the shaper. You just don't have enough clearance for the uh, tool head here to, to cross over it. Um, I tried it without the swivel base and dropped it down, and it was right there at it, but it was still just a little too high to clear back here. So I just couldn't use it. So we've got it set up on an angle plate right here. Got it pulled down with uh, two studs here. And I have a stud running all the way through and a clamp on the back side. So we've got it sucked up to the angle plate. And how I squared it up is this I already machined over on the horizontal boring mill at work. I did a fly cut on that to get that square. And what I, what I had done was squared it up with the square butt here and just got it kind of square. This isn't too critical on how square that is, but we did use our our combination square there. And I've got it square this way in relation to this face. And I use my stare at machine square here. This is the one with the beveled edge. And I just I put it up on what was left of the table right here and held it down very firmly and run it up to it and just lightly bump this thing around until it was completely square there. All right, so I think that's gonna be good enough to go. Now, I don't know if I'm gonna do the entire job over here on the shaper, but I did wanna make a few cuts on it, try to you know, see, see how I can do over here. But we're probably gonna end up going over to the K&T mill later and using the big face mill to do some milling on it. And on the inside here where it's been cut out, this is one of the things that I wanted to try to do on the shaper, but I had mocked it up as well with a tool holder. I'll show you. I've got this bar holder right here that goes in there, and then I got a couple boring bars that go in here. So this is what you would do if you do an internal slot, keyway, or th something like that. But there's just not enough room on the shaper to get in there and do a lot of things like that, unless it was a, a very small part why I want a big big shaper to be able to do this kind of stuff on so we're gonna go ahead and touch off and start making a cut and see how we do I've got a I went ahead and uh, I'll, I'll take this tool out just so that you can see my uh, my grind here I do have it tightened down pretty good but I'll, I'll just reset that so this is the tool that I'm using, and this is a fresh grind. So I have back rake, and we have side rake, and we have the proper clearance underneath it, and we've got a nice honed radius there. Honed on the top, so the edge, that cutting edge, just feels very, very sharp. So it should do a pretty good job, but we'll see. We'll get that reset, and we'll start making a cut. Just touched it right here. So I dropped it down a sixteenth of an inch. We'll go ahead and see how that does. We have, depending on where you measure it, we have approximately 150 to 200 thousandths to come off the total width of this. Okay, so we'll, we'll probably do like a sixteenth on each side or, and uh, take it from there.
doing a 10,000 step over. I do have the knee support bracket locked down here and the knee lock on the back. Sixteenth is doing pretty good. We cut all the way across it. Right, so that's a twelve thousand step over there. This particular machine can't handle a, a big step overs like the big Cincinnati's can. I can't. I probably can only go to about fifteen thousand. So we got our first void right there that's not cleaned up and I just imagine that this one here is not going to clean up either but I think what I might do on this I, I haven't decided yet at this point might see how the rest of it cleans up here and if it looks pretty good I might just flip it over and cut the other side on the shaper and then from there we may go set it up on the mill and use a big face mill to get it milled into size so I know that might sound a little ridiculous to some people, but as I said before, I'm in no hurry. It's Saturday and I got all weekend to play with this thing. So that's what we're gonna do. Definitely got some voids here that we didn't clean up. And another thing that I'm noticing here, I was getting, I, was, I noticed a little bit of flexing. I could see it. When that tool pushes on this end, this angle plate is flexing. This side over here is picking up. Now it's not a lot, but you can, I can feel it whenever it does it. One of the benefits what we're doing is we're getting rid of most of all this flame cut, which can really mess up your carbide inserts on face mills or your high speed tooling for end mills and shell mills those uh those burned edges are usually kind of hard and it burns up your corners 
best to always try to get underneath them and not let the tips of the tools rub on them. Hopefully y'all can see this a little better than before. I've, I've got three extra lights above us trying to light the area up and the GoPro loves lighting. It is a little rough. My tool broke down some, I can tell. But it, it was a lighter cut on this end and I can tell the difference between this half and this and this half here. It was getting into that hard stuff. Yeah, I can really see where it was trying to skate across uh, a harder surface crust from that flame cutting. I may I may take another cut on this side. I just haven't decided yet. The very edge of it where it's where it shears is uh, kind of rounded off and that's from this hard area here. So there's that's one of the benefits right there of using a shaper for jobs like this where you have a real nasty edge is you have one fairly inexpensive tool that you can just regrind and you're not burning up your expensive tools to uh, get it cut down. So I think I might make one more cut on this off camera to uh, get it down a little bit a little bit closer and uh, then I'll flip it over and and I'll make a cut on the other side. I decided to make one more cut. I went at, I went down another 60 thousandths, which is 16th of an inch there. And I'm gonna let that pass across and then I'll flip it over and cut the other side. I made a change to the setup that I think is working actually better for this. So a minute ago, I was telling you how the angle plate was flexing whenever it pushed into the cut. Now you can see that back here, we've got a little bit of a ridge where it starts to cut and digs in. And then back here, on this side, it's not really doing it so bad. So I changed the clamps. I put two of them on there and, and stretched them all the way across there. And that really seemed to help that. I believe this cut's going to clean all this up, but I may go back. I'm going to go back across there with a really fine cut. That way, this ridge, I know that this ridge isn't there, okay? That's a real light finishing pass. That actually feels nice and smooth. That's a good finish on there. And we're cleaning up that little edge where it digs in on the side from that heavy cut. Just finished our finished cut here. It did a good job. So we, could, we can improve this by changing up the grind. That's still a rough cut grind and slowing the feed rate down some. But this is uh, fantastic for doing jobs like this. I mean, that would be um, acceptable, definitely. So I think I'm done with the shaper for today. We've got enough practice. We are gonna go to the K&T and we're gonna use that big uh, T-Max face mill that I got from Kevin. And we're gonna use that and finish milling this thing to size. We made it over here to the K and T, so we're going to use this Sandvik T Max 45 to finish milling this thing down on the, on both the sides right there. I've already got her touched here, and I moved the table up a hundred thousandths, and we're going to start it off right there and make a cut. See, we're having to cut into that flame cut crust there, so it's, that's what some of that sparking that you see from that. I had to back off some because it's, it, it's, it sounded like it was trying to chatter on me a little bit.
We're gonna do one light cleanup pass across there. good nice finish it's a pretty fast feed but it looks great we're going to deburr this here and I'll flip it over I'm going to do the same thing I'm just going to make a really light cut just to clean up the other side all right we moved it up five thousandths if it cleans it up square That's looking good. I was curious if the shaper had cut it completely square. It looks like it is. Alright, so we got nice matching cuts on both sides. Nice and smooth. Looks good. I'm going to take it right back out and uh, deburr it. And we want to try to work on this inside. So I'm going to see what I can do about setting up one of those big end mills that I've been given. I've, I've been given a couple of them. And uh, see if we can get in there and do some side milling to clean this inside up right there. We're going to use that long two inch end mill there. That was given to me by Paul's Welding Service here recently. Uh, hopefully it'll do a good job and, and clean this up. We don't have a whole lot to take out of there. But there is some. And cutting this inside usually is uh, hard on those tools so I already tried setting this my plan was to stand it up and side mill the whole depth down there but believe it or not there's not enough height on this milling machine uh, with with the holder and the end mill and the table all the way down it still wouldn't clear the bottom right here so I had to set it up and do it like this so we're gonna go ahead with it and see how she does You can see our cut in there. It did pretty good. I'm surprised. It was kind of banging around at the front because I didn't have the knee locked. It was kind of hitting it around a little bit. I'll get a measurement there and see how much we need to take off.
So this cut here is a 30,000 10 feed. And we're running one inch a minute. I was at inch and a half and it was trying to squeal a little bit hard. So I backed off the one. Let's see what we're running. I'm only running 65 RPM and my my attempts to run it slow is to try to save that what's left of the cutting edge there and not burn it up on that uh, kind of hard crust with that flame cut. The mill's doing pretty good though, I gotta say. It's uh, doing much better than that Akron mill does. I don't have flood coolant, that's why I use this coolant mist. I never did set up that flood coolant tank there, but this does pretty good. Inch and a half is what I wanted on the, the thickness there. So. I think we're pretty good on that. There's going to be enough clearance in there for that. So, all right, we got to come over here and do this side. And you can see just there that we got about a sixteenth, about a hundred thousandths in the middle of it. I got it milled in where I want it, so we're all done with what I'm going to do here. This is all I was going to handle. I'm going to, uh, we're going to take it back to work and do our, we got to bore our holes here, we got to bore it and thread it for it to screw onto the rod. And then in, in these cases, usually all I do is I set up in the bandsaw and I cut 45 degree angles here to, uh, to relieve these corners. Some of the uh, factory made ones where they're casted and they're, um, they're radius on this end but we usually just 45 them whenever they're a fabricated piece. But we hit our three inch in the middle right there. We got our inch and a half thick ears and our uh, six inch total width. So we're good to go. Just having a little bit of fun in the shop on the weekend, Saturday, but I'm about done. I'm tired of this. I'm gonna go and get cleaned up and go drink me a beer somewhere. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed. We'll see you next time. So Monday morning I took it back in to work with me and I finished it out. Here we are set up in the horizontal bore mill, the kerns, and I'm using a two inch drill bit. As you can see there, I do have a pilot hole of about 7 16 so we got a two inch drill. And I had posted that clip there on Instagram and the guys always love hearing the nice chipping action come out of that with the drill. I had touched up that drill, put a nice grind on it so that I had a nice even cut. Both flutes were cutting nice and even and, and that was the reason why I took that shot there. But I don't really, I don't have any other machining shots of this other than it being completely finished. So this is, that's the drill gauge that I use to grind the drill bit. And then this is the new rod that goes with that cylinder that that clevis is going on. So there it is, machined and then the Clevis completely machined, finished up. We got the 45s cut on the corner. The whole board through the center, which is two and a half, and the uh, center threads is two and a half, 12. And this is a clevis of identical size going to an identical cylinder. Both of them come in as a matching pair of cylinders. What was wrong with this one is that somebody had welded that rod to that clevis. So it's very difficult to unscrew off there. You can see where I've kind of got the welds ground out of the way. And what I'm doing is I'm drilling and machining this rod out of there. The rod was bad, so we just bandsawed it off so the guys could get it apart and get it quoted. And then time was added to it to machine this out and save the clothes. So you, you see me drilling the hole, and now what I'm doing, I'm using an insert tool and I'm facing that area off because that's larger than the threads. 
and I wanted to face that off and get that out of the way and make a nice clean face there on the on the square block uh, for whenever it shoulders up to the new rod and after this is machined off there I was able to go in there and bore it out I don't have any video there to share but we've got some pictures here so what we do is I just bore it out until it gets thin enough to it'll it'll actually peel that that thread out of there which is what you see on the boring bar that's that's the rod that was in there you just get you start cutting through that wall and eventually it just tears it out of there and it comes out kind of like a coil spring a, a lot of times so there's a little closer shot to see what's left of it and and it worked out great i was able to run a two and a half 12 tap through that hole and it cleaned it up just fine so there's a shot of me holding the what was left of the threaded rod that was stuck in there and one last segment before we go so this is the rod that we're replacing and that's two pistons on the end of that rod but what's going on that rod that piston there somebody had actually bored that out and sleeved it pressed the sleeve in there and then threaded it and screwed it back on that rod and you see it failed that was not an adequate fix for something like that I don't know why it was done that way it may have been a, a quick fix to get it going but it was still an incorrect way to fix that you can see they had it flanged on that end you know in the set screws going into the rod to keep the piston from spinning off but that hydraulic pressure that's a 3000 psi cylinder and it was too much for that pressed in sleeve that's the sleeve is still stuck on the threads right there so that's one way not to fix a piston if you have damaged threads you need to replace it or bore them out to a larger size and you have to economate the rod for it also so here's the new piston being machined that's an 8 inch diameter piston it uses the iron rings uh, iron piston ring so there's the new piston and the other one that slides on in front of that which is really just used as a, a stop tube or a spacer uh, the seals don't go on that or the rings don't so there's the new rod that I machined for it's a three and a half inch chrome rod and test fitting it with the new piston there and then I got a couple more shots of everything together both pistons on there the cushion sleeve that's just in front of it there and Everything worked out great. We we're going together. There's a final shot of the of everything screwed on there together and and what it'll look like as it goes in there. So that's the new piston, new rod, and then you've already seen the new clevis that goes on the opposite end for this complete cylinder rebuild.